Thanks for joining us on Shannon's Club TV, where we reflect on significant cars that appeared on Australian roads and racetracks. On the Shannon's Club website, you'll find a huge selection of previous episodes, motoring forums and free content. Today, we're taking a look at the Volvo that prioritised safety at the expense of flair, the 140 series. Volvo got off to a great start in Australia with the 120 series. Enthusiasts rated the Swedish cars highly for their quality, performance and effortless cruising ability over all roads. Compared with the EJ Holden and XK Falcon, a 122S sedan felt sophisticated and refined. Its closest rival was probably the highly rated Peugeot 404. But between 1962, when the 122S arrived, and April 1967, when its successor, the 144S, was introduced, the Australian automotive market had changed almost unbelievably. The XR Falcon had rewritten the rules for local sedans, even before we consider the Falcon GT and Fairlane 500. The enormous improvements in Australian cars perhaps helps explain why the Volvo image suffered more here than in most other markets. The 144S seemed hardly better than the old model. The 144S looked conservative even when it was new. There were elements of the Ford Cortina Mark II and the Hillman Hunter to the design, but there was a kind of unsporting toughness and practicality to this new Volvo with its six window glass house and upright, narrow, boxy appearance. That's not to say that its predecessor ever looked especially sporting, but compared with contemporaries such as the aforementioned Holden and Falcon or even the Peugeot 404, it was quite easy to look at the Volvo 122S and call it a sports sedan. Mark, did the 140 series Volvo have a life in motorsport? Well, in local rallying, certainly, you know, where, its, where its inherent ruggedness really was an asset. Um, it was quite competitive in local rallying, actually, with a guy like John Kerrin at the controls. And there was, in fact, an all-Aussie multi-car Volvo 140 series team entered in the 1968 London to Sydney rally. So oh, they had a very yes. high profile on the dirt, but on the racetrack, you know, they were very rarely seen. Right, mm. OK. The 140 series incorporated extremely high levels of safety. Its twin triangular dual circuit braking system gave 80% efficiency even if one circuit failed completely. There was a roll bar integrated into the roof. Extensive dashboard padding and recess controls also set the new Volvo apart from its rivals. As with the 120, the 140 was to be produced in three basic variants. Two-door sedan, 142, four-door sedan, 144, and five-door, 145 wagon. In early 1972, local assembly began in Clayton in the old Volkswagen plant. But the great advantage Volvo enjoyed over most European rivals in the early 1960s had evaporated, and safety was overemphasised at the expense of most of the other desirable automotive attributes. Mark, no doubt the 120 series set high expectations mm. for its successor. Yeah, it sure did. But if you were into performance motoring, you might have been a bit disappointed. The arrival of the 140 series Volvo in 1967 started to change perceptions of the Swedish mark after the 120 series had won universal praise for its engineering refinement and sporty performance. A growing emphasis on safety and no major engine changes resulted in the new 140 series failing to live up to sporting expectations. Although they proved to be excellent rally cars, winning numerous local events, including the prestigious Southern Cross in 1968, it was only a matter of time before someone would give the new Volvo the steroid injection it needed on the racetrack. John, the 140 was a, you know, a pivotal car in Volvo history because it really marked that clear change in philosophy, didn't it? It did. The 122S, like quite a lot of other European cars, was, was a very safe model mm. and Volvo had a heritage of safety. But with the, the 140 series, it was as if they threw out almost everything else it that, really that appealed to enthusiasts and said, look, safe, 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 mm. and drummed that message home. And I think uh, a lot of people who had 
loved the 122S must have been very disappointed when they found the 144S was really no quicker and didn't handle quite as well and so on. Well, we have spoken before. I mean, Mercedes-Benz at the same time, you know, it was very much pushing uh, safety as well. Yes. But the difference with Mercedes was they had all these other elements to their car, yes. whereas Volvo was just a total focus on safety, and I think that was probably the, mis the mistake they I think made. they forsook the glamour. Mm. I think that the, the old car had a, a certain measure, measure of glamour, like a Mercedes-Benz in a way, but the, the 144S was kind of like a Hillman Hunter, not on very good steroids, yeah, if you that like. Was, that, you was know. The, that was the turning yes, point, Yes, I think it? so. A Volvo 140 does not spring to mind when talking about high-performance cars unless someone was crazy enough to bolt a Chev V8 under the bonnet and go racing. Volvo specialist Jerry Lister did just that in the early 1970s, thanks to the liberal rules of sports sedan racing. Lister started with a hotted up 142S, which was soon upgraded with a 3-litre straight 6 adapted from the 160 series. However, he knew that a V8 was the only answer so he installed a full house Chevrolet 5 litre race engine, which after extensive body surgery, resulted in a wild mid-engine layout with more than 500 brake horsepower. Now if any Volvo was going to contradict the firm's safety message, it was this one. Its ferocious throttle response and fearful straight line speed showed great potential, but Lister's growing business commitments forced him to sell the car to Phil Lucas, who developed the Volvo Chev into one of Australia's fastest sports sedans. Amazingly, it was still racing in the early 1980s, with more wild modifications under fourth owner John Tessarero, before finally being retired from active duty. And no doubt, some safety conscious Volvo executives would have breathed a huge sigh of relief. Don't forget, you can find your favourite car club or event on the Shannon's Club website. My name is Len Ward. The car is a 1969 Volvo and 144 with a B20 motor in it. Mechanically, it's still exactly the same as when we bought it. The only thing I've done to it is rejuco it. As far as the rest of the car, it's all original. It's only a single carby, 90 horsepower, a column change automatic with a Borg Warner 35. A good solid car, good safe car, a dual circuit braking system, which cars never had. If one system breaks down, the other one takes over. It's just, just beautiful to drive. Corners well. Economical on fuel, about 25, 26 miles a gallon out of it. The comfort, low maintenance. They're just a good, good solid car. Even with an automatic, it just goes beautifully. I got interested in Volvos in 1968 and I went to a dealership in St Kilda. I went in and asked for a 120 wagons. They said, no, they don't make them. He said, there's a chap up in Mooney Pond who had a couple of cars there for sale. Went up there and I bought my 122 in 1968, which I've had ever since. I've been with Shannon's Insurance for about eight years and I've found them absolutely terrific. I've got six, six Volvos. They're all insured with Shannon. No problems at all. I like the, the design of it and the driving of it. It's a comfortable car, the seats are beautiful and it just cruises along very, very nicely. Well, Tony Hanson from Shannon's Auctions joins us to talk about the 140 series. Welcome to the show, mate. Thanks, Mark. How are you going? Welcome, Tony. The 140 Series Volvo, I'm imagining, mm. doesn't pop up too often in the Shannon's auctions catalogue. Not at all. No, no. I don't think we've actually seen one through the auction uh, at this point in time. Mm. No. So there must be, I guess, uh, if someone's after a car like this, there must be some sort of perhaps some childhood nostalgia value and wanting to own something like the 140? I would think so. I mean, yeah. uh, probably, you know, their parents had one. Yeah. Uh, could have been that the parents moved on to a different car, mm. given the car to their, to their siblings as... Uh, as they moved on. Yeah. I think a point of interest about the 144S I'm thinking of was the one that was popular in yeah. Australia was yeah. it was almost the first car that really made a huge issue out of safety. They'd certainly pushed the safety aspect of that of the Volvo to in the, the early days. Yeah. Almost to the detriment of just about everything, everything else. else. But yeah. I'm wondering whether at some point in the future, Tiny, that would make the car 
particularly interesting to collectors? Well, it'd be one of the interesting points. I mean, mm. uh, normally collectors are looking for different uh, points of interest in cars that they collect, and that would certainly be one of, one of the major points. Yeah, because we were talking about uncool cool, as they call it, you know, <laughs> cars that, that perhaps aren't in that niche, but they're, they're cool because they're, they're different. They are cool because they're different. Mm. Um, and yeah, look, there, there is a market for them out there. Mm. It might be only a small market, and I would think if you're looking for that particular car, mm. club scene would be the first place to look for, I would think. And of course, back in that era, mm. in the in the late 60s, cars were very different from each other, weren't they? I they mean, were. you, you look at the Volvo 144S, and then you look at an HK Holden, I mean, yeah. almost big nothing yeah. in yeah. Yeah. Big difference. And John makes a good point, the S was of course the, the twin carby option. So I guess if you're looking for a classic Volvo, the twin carby thing would be more desirable. More desirable. Yeah. Less, of, less of them made, obviously, yeah. so it makes them a little bit more harder to find. Yeah. So, yeah. so I guess if we're talking about, there's a lot of Volvo specialists around, but if you're going to buy one of these things, you know, there's not enough fat in it to do a full restoration. What you're looking for is a car with low miles, you know, really good ownership history, that sort of thing. Low miles, good body, not a yep. lot of rust. Mm. Yep. They are out there. You just yeah. got to go. You just got to look for them and find them. Terrific. Well, thank you very much for joining us. No, it's all my pleasure. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, mate. And remember, you can keep up to date with all the latest Shannon's auctions news on the Shannon's Club website. If you'd like a memorable competition image of the Volvo 140, check out the archive at autopix.com.au. John, we focused you know, wholly on the 140 series, but we should mention uh, the 160 series, which was yeah, very similar. Well, the only Volvo I've ever owned was the 164E, which mm. really had a terrific turn of performance, and I like the look of it better, the, the, the more positive, assertive kind of nose. Yeah. It showed that Volvo hadn't completely forgotten about performance. Yeah, it was an interesting period though, wasn't it? That car we've spoken before about, yes. you know, these quite stylish looking cars coming up through the PVs, the, yes. the 120 series, the, Amazon, yeah. the, the P1800, and then they got to the 140 and it was like, okay, we're going safety and we're going square. And yes. It, and, it was, and it was there for a long time, wasn't it? It's absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. Well, we hope you've enjoyed reflecting on the pivotal 140 series Volvo. We look forward to your company next time on Shannon's Club TV. Bye for now.